Hi, welcome to Stories from My Drinking Days. My name's Harry Fell and I'm the founder of Nolo Cocktails and Bars. We are joined today by Matthias uh, Latteo. Um, Matthias is an ambassador for Healthy Hospo and the co-founder of the Healthy Hospo Chess Club. In 2005, he turned his back on a promising law career to move to London and work in hospitality. He now dedicates his time to promote mental health and well-being in our beloved industry through his work in the non-alcoholic space. He lives his life through his passions and spends his downtime, well, playing chess and spreading his love of the game. It's wonderful to meet you, Matthias. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Harry. It's nice to meet you too, finally. Yeah. I know. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so we'll start just by talking about your drinking journey, but I've got lots of questions about why you'd leave law to go to hospitality, because hospitality is <laughs> what I've been doing for the last uh, 20 years. Um, so do you remember having your first drink? Um, I remember having my first taste of alcoholic drink. Uh, yeah. um, so I grew up in France, in a family that enjoy their, their, their drinks, uh, whether it's wine uh, with dinner or the, uh, the traditional aperitif before dinner. Um, or, you know, growing up um, at some point between the age of seven and age 10, uh, I was right that deep into the, uh, the, the Bordeaux wine region. And uh, my, my parents' favorite pastime was to uh, to head to a chateau of some sort at the weekend so that we could have a lovely walk around. And then, you know, my dad and my mom would uh, would pick up a case of wine uh, on the way back. Uh, so, and, and you know, I, I don't know if it's a, a, a culture thing, but I was always kind of um, not encouraged, but, you know, very early on, my, my, my dad would kind of let me dip my finger into his wine, just have a taste. And, you know, when you're a kid, you just, don't, you very much dislike it, so you get you stay away from it. Yeah, uh, yeah I was allowed to uh, to sip on uh, my my dad's beer head. So I had uh, you know the, uh, very early on, let's let's say like 10, 12 years of age, I, I would be able to to sip on my dad's beer head. Um, but my very first drink, as such, I think it came as I was. Um, going through my last year of college. So college in France is secondary school, I believe, in, in the UK. So I was 14 years of age, and that's when um, you know, I was trying a bit of everything. Uh, that's when I started smoking cigarettes. And uh, that's when we kind of uh, tried to try different drinks and, and, and kind of trying to sneak out of the house and, and drink a few beers. and. Um, and then, then the following year, when I started high school, I remember the first summer after high school, I spent every afternoon at the pub. And that was a novelty for me. Um, and every afternoon, and we were drinking low alcohol beers, but, um, you know, that's kind of uh, where, when it all started, I think. Yeah. And then how did your relationship with alcohol develop from there then? Um, I think, so I, alcohol always been around me. Uh, you know, I, again, I grew up in a family where, you know, at the weekend, um, my mom and dad would enjoy a glass of, of wine and an aperitif, lunch and dinner every day, uh, Saturday, Sunday, that is. Um, so it's kind of always been around me. And, um, and I think I'm trying to think because um, it's always kind of developed um, in a spiky way, if you like. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I was exposed to alcohol as um, to the extreme of of what alcohol can do to to a, a human being through both my mom and dad uh, falling into alcoholism when I was about. 14, 15 years of age. Uh, cutting a long story short, they set up a business uh, as my uh, mom was set to return to a professional life after looking after uh, me and my two sisters for a number of years. And my mom that set up a new business that went bankrupt within the first year. And, and that's when everything kind of spiraled down. Um, so I, I, I feel like I was oblivious to what was going on 
around me, uh, but I have memories of my mom passed out on the bed halfway through the afternoon as I came back home with the, with some friends. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't understand at the time, uh, but now in hindsight, that was clear. That's that's kind of that, that was alcohol doing the doing his things on my family. Um, so I had kind of this in the background. Um, and, um, and I think, yeah, from the very young age, I, I find it very difficult to say no to a drink. Yeah. Um, and I remember, and that's something that I've been told recently of something that happened when I was, when I was 17 years of age. So I was playing basketball, uh, at, um, national level and, or, and before that I was considered to be the, the, the best prospect of my local club and apparently my coach at the time would have said to 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 my uh, to my um to my family that yes i am a prospect for the club but i need to watch the booze so very early on i show some sign of i wouldn't say addiction but some sign of having tendency to enjoy an to overindulge yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, <clears throat> and and then you know, um, university. I don't think I, I drank that much at university because I was commuting, um, commuting to go to uni. So I never never really socialized, and I had basketball. I was playing basketball like five times a week, um, so that was not really part of my uh, of my life up until I graduated. Struggled to find a job in France as a lawyer and cross the channel, find myself um, in the middle of London with no job, no connection. I could barely speak a word of English. And I guess that, you know, I kind of went to my um, natural coping kind of uh, mechanism uh, to deal with the, with the stress of, of starting a new life, a new life essentially. Yeah. Uh, I landed a job in hospitality, and it was just normal to have a beer after work, after a long shift. And I guess, you know, that's kind of how it started to be fully engraved into who I was at the time and who I kind of had developed to be over, over a number of years. Yeah. So how old were you when you came to the UK? I was, so 2005, I was 23 years of age. Okay. And did you mainly move because you were finding it difficult to find a job in in France? Yes. So uh, it was um, it was a really hard time. So I graduated with a master's degree in intellectual property from mm -hmm. law school, and I was keen to work in my specialty. And I couldn't find. I really struggled to find a to find a job at the time. And and also there was a lot of things. I had a lot of things on my plate. I had some health issues. Uh, I did um, two back-to-back -back pneumothoraxes that um, pushed me to have lung surgery. Um, and then I was in a very toxic relationship at the time um, with the, an ex-girlfriend. Um, and uh, there was a number of things that made that, that prompted me to almost run away from everything. Uh, yeah. After the surgery, after a year of searching for a job, and you know, when everyone tells you that you're you're possibly the the most talented student in 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 the class, and and you end up with nothing, um, like for a year, I've been given one interview. So that was just kind of uh, uh, I found myself kind of on on the on the verge of depression, really, um, and that felt like a way out. So I just bought a single. I, I said to my dad, "Can you get can you get me a laptop?" Uh, there's this uh, this exam for um, the European Commission. So I, I had the, a position at the European Commission in view. Um, and I was like, well, the thing is that the, the exams is in two languages. I really need to do something about my English. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go to to London um, with the main purpose to find a find a small job, study uh, for the exam, improve my English at the same time. And, uh, and and kind of run away from all the uh, uh, all, <laughs> all, the the, all the challenges that I couldn't face at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so my, my dad gave me a bit of cash, 
uh, bought a single ticket to London. And, you know, Eurostar, I was living in Lille up north, so it's like an hour and 20, across the channel, single ticket. I had like two massive suitcases with me. Um, and uh, yeah, I got lucky to find a job in hospitality within two weeks. And uh, that quickly got in the way of my studying. So I kind of failed, uh, so six months later, I failed the, uh, the exam of the European Commission. And then I started to kind of find a new passion for hospitality and for what I was doing. I was a bartender at the time. I didn't know anything about cocktails or bartending when I first been pushed behind the bar. And I found it fascinating. And, uh, and so I was like, okay, I can, I can run with that. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the rest is history. Made a <laughs> so is it at that, at that point that you um, sort of gave up on your plans then for going into law? Yes, I mean, I, I gave up in a few stages. Uh, so the when I failed the, the, the exam of the European Commission, that was a big blow because I was kind of, I put all my eggs in that basket at the time. Um, but I was quite enjoying my, my job. I was working as a bartender. So I started as a commie waiter, not yeah. the most fulfilling job at the time. There was a beautiful little three rosette restaurant in Notting Hill. Uh, but I was kind of polishing plates and serving plates, serving dishes. Uh, and then within two months, I've been pushed behind the bar because there was no one else. Uh, I had no idea how to make the, the, the most simple drinks. Uh, but I had this eager to learn. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, I'm just wondering how that eagerness or that willingness to learn about drinks and cocktails was connected to my natural tendency to um, to alcoholism, you know, for the yeah. lack of the word. Because, um, and uh, anyway, going back to the to the question. So after six months, I failed the exam, and I'm like, okay, I I didn't feel comfortable to search for a job in in legal. Even, even if that was uh, just a paralegal job, I just kind of, uh, I felt like my English, my English was just not good enough. So I was like, okay, I'll keep going with, with my job as a bartender and uh, we'll see where that leads me. And next thing you know, I landed a job as a bartender at the Konot Hotel, uh, which is one of the most iconic and prestigious hotel in London. Um, and I was working with a, with a legend of the bar at the time, uh, a gentleman called Brian Silver, who now runs the show at Rules in Covent Garden. And uh, yeah, so that was like, okay, I, I, you know, I can make a, a career of this. And then six months later, the bar closes because the hotel go, undergoes refurbishment. And that's when very briefly, I, re I considered searching for a legal job in London, uh, but I was also feeling the pressure of earning so that I could pay for my bills. So as I kind of considered and started to re rework my CV, I just popped in my local bar, which happened to be um, an award-winning an award winning cocktail bar that recently opened. I just popped in and, and landed a job there within, within a few weeks. Uh, and that's when I put the law behind for good yeah yeah um so i mean that that's really interesting and there's um uh, actually some parallels to my uh career journey as well but because i've been running a hotel now for the last 20 years but before i came down here to run this hotel um i was actually studying law <laughs> so <laughs> i i'd done my um pgvl the because i had a degree but it wasn't a law degree so i did the conversion course and i was due to go and start doing an msc in international human rights um and instead dropped that and um came came down to run a hotel so yeah quite quite similar parallels i think quite a change of career yeah <laughs> Exactly. So how did you find working in a bar then and how that affected your own drinking? That, that was, um, that affected my drinking to a great extent. 
Um, I think, I think uh, I was com I was completely careless and oblivious to kind of what I was doing, but um, but I was drinking every day. I was drinking during work um, because it was kind of accepted back back then. I'm talking 2007, 2010. Um, I was running a tequila bar. I was running a tequila bar, um, and we were internationally acclaimed. We had uh, guests coming from across town as well as from abroad to come and see us because we had the largest selection of tequila, 100% agave tequila in Europe um, at the time. And I made a point to to build my knowledge to a point where um, I, 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 yeah, people would come and see me to to learn about about tequila, um, and 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 to come and see me and my team, and um, and the thing is that we had tequila available to us, like uh, it was within arm's length. Uh, we had guests coming in and wanted to to take to go on a journey of tequila with us behind the bar. So, you know, the, very regularly we had customers offering us a tequila. And while today, very few bartenders will accept such an offer, you know, they, but thank you very much. But, you know, uh, drinking is not allowed during the shift. Back then, um, it was part of the, the experience, if you, if you came to see us. Um, and then the next thing you know, um, the beer after work, that I experienced when I first moved to London and started in hospitality quickly became a beer and a tequila. And then uh, on Saturdays, after a very long shift to celebrate, it's, it becomes quickly two beers and two tequilas and sometimes more, um, sometimes more. So um, when I look back at the amount of drinking I was doing back then, I am like, I feel there's a lot of shame attached to 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 unhealthy relationship with alcohol already. But when I look back, I'm like, this is just wrong on so many levels. Um, but at the time, I'm like, I, I, I felt like I was convincing myself I was having the time of my life. Yeah. And, yeah. And and I think uh, without fully acknowledging it this took a toll on me and I decided that I needed to to make a move. Um, and I think at the time I was convincing myself that what was not in line with with me and what I wanted to do for my life was the um, the working hours. But I think that was much more than that. And uh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it really kind of impacted my drinking. And also, I don't know about you, but working in hospitality, it feels like whenever I had a bit of time off, I would either come and visit my own bar or meet up with friends in another bar. And that's all I was doing. You know, I, I put aside all my passions that I had growing up just for the drinking, because that's all, that's all I've, I've done for three years for more men, even more than, um, yeah. So, um, so it's massive impact, massive impact. Yeah. And so you went from working in the tequila bar, didn't you, to being a brand ambassador, is that right? Yes. I, and I started, so two of the owners of, of the tequila bar, green and red, uh, had a consultancy company and they were, um, they were consulting on the, on the, a new product development for, um, for uh, a Mexican tequila company owned by Pernod Ricard. And, uh, and uh, as part of the development of a new product and the launch in, in market, they developed an, an ed education pr program. And uh, I was really um, fascinated by, um, well, I'm, I truly enjoy sharing my knowledge. And from that perspective, uh, I thought that would be a, a a great next step for me to go and work for them and and help educate uh, hospitality professionals on the category of tequila 
Um, so I went um, I went to work for for them for Henry uh, Besson um, and the Towner Society. And um, and uh, yeah, I did that for a year and a half up until Pernod Ricard wanted to give the uh, the, the newly launched Olmec Altos tequila a boost in market in the UK market and uh, um, asked me if I wanted to come on board as the uh, official brand ambassador uh, to the UK, uh, which I did in, in 2011. Um, and, you know, it feels like as I'm telling you that story, it was always led through my passion for for tequila, my passion for Mexico and the culture and all of that. But deep inside, you know, 20 years, uh, I mean, sorry, 12 years later, when I look at it, I'm like, it's all connected to my relationship with alcohol. I was kind of too scared to, to be too far away from easy drinking. Yeah. That's yeah. my interpretation today, um, 12, 13 years later. Yeah, yeah. So I know um, you've um, written on, on, certainly on Healthy Hospo, about how actually working as a brand ambassador, you'd come back from work trips completely broken. Mm -hmm. Is that when you decided that you kind of had to make a change with your relationship with alcohol? I wish. I wish. <laughs> I was never enough. I, I would, I would, I would come back broken, and then I would recover within two or three days, and then I would be back at it. Um, it's a funny one. So the, the the thing is that I always wanted to make moderation work for myself. You know, I was scared about what life would be without alcohol. I knew alcohol was detrimental to my to my myself to as a person, uh, but nothing was kind of hitting me hard enough uh, for me to, to consider quitting completely. I was just too scared that I would be either bored or I couldn't do without. I love my wine too much with my meals. I love my aperitif, my digestive too much. You know, it's just like that kind of story that runs uh, through uh, through my head. It's like, you know, you, you go on a, on a big night out you wake up with a hangover, it's like never again. Next thing you know, it's 5 p.m. You've recovered from your hangover and you're back at it. Yeah. Uh, so it was never uh, enough. But obviously, it was kind of starting to make me consider that perhaps I, my relationship to alcohol is far from healthy. And, you know, with the with my family history, uh, I'm like, okay, I need, to, I need to be mindful of this. But again... No, no, never, never enough for me to, to fully quit. And what prompted uh, me to go sober, so three and a half years ago, was the fact that I realized alcohol had damaged my fertility. And for the past two years, we were trying to have a second child with my wife. Uh, we had a series of, of misfortunes and uh, yeah, we, we, we never really imagined that could come from me. So we tried everything up until my wife said, I'd like you to get tested, which I did. And uh, my fertility was below, that was four times below normal. And a funny one, I'm like, okay. Uh, that's something that I can turn around after three months of sobriety. So I'm going to give it a go, you know, in order to kind of uh, manage my my relationship with alcohol uh, throughout my career, I took on running, long distance running. And I, I, I've done a lot of marathon races and every time to try and put myself in the best position possible kind of shape, physical shape, I would stop drinking for a month or six weeks. So I've done this before. I knew how to do it. And I'm like, okay, I'm, that's our last shot, uh, kind of having a, um, a family of, of four. So uh, let's give it a go. And uh, and uh, three months later, four months later, we were pregnant again. Um, and I was, uh, and, and at that time, I'm like, okay, 
we're gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna keep going up until the 12 week scan and we know that's a healthy pregnancy but i was already thinking about how i'm going to celebrate i was already thinking about what kind of bottle of champagne i'm going to open when we know that the pregnancy is healthy now the thing is is i was working with a therapist on how i'm going to reintroduce alcohol into my life and it's just kind of one day i woke up thinking what are you doing you know you know you you're not even drinking and it's a struggle and so that's when i decided that i would lead a sober life um and i never looked back it was three and a half years ago and now i've got a very healthy two and a half years son son um and he, he wouldn't be here if that wasn't for my sobriety yeah that's amazing and it is amazing how it, alcohol can affect so much of our physical health as well as our mental health yes and you know what if anything i also like as i started to kind of comprehend the the effect of that alcohol had on my life one of the things that i felt like i was losing brain sharpness by the day uh, i wouldn't recognize myself anymore um and and i'm glad to say that little by little i'm reclaiming that brain fitness and that brain sharpness today um yeah. which is which feels amazing yeah so how did the decision to go sober then and completely give up alcohol affect your um, professional life? Well, so <laughs> again, deep impact because at that time I was still working for one of the major players and I just landed a job in, uh, in sales. So I work in brand advocacy and activation for most of my career at Pernodica UK. And then I wanted to broaden my set of skills. So I went into, into sales uh, and account management. Um, and um, so I started, I, I started sobriety during the pandemic. Um, so I was at home at the time. And then uh, when the hospitality reopened in September 2020, um, I find myself as a sober person trying to sell spirits and, and champagne at some of the top bars and establishments in, in London. And that was incredibly challenging mentally. Um, and it became clear that I had to make a change. Uh, and that was two changes to consider, right? Either I kind of go back to drinking alcohol or either I, I kind of... Uh, make a new career turn of some sort uh, it took me a little while to um to make it happen i think it took me a year um as i was kind of navigating my my mental challenges my mental health challenges at the time um and uh, uh but yeah it, it was clear that i had to 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 do something about it and after spending 15 years in both hospitality and drinks industry, I felt like I wanted to stay within the industry. I wasn't quite clear what I wanted to do. And uh, an opportunity um, arose to join a startup company in the non-alcoholic space of the drinks industry. And that was very exciting. So I just, I just jumped in, jumped in. And uh, that's how I immersed myself in the non-alcoholic space. And I find kind of a, uh, a renewed sense of purpose within the industry that I've operated in for so many years. Yeah, yeah. So, and who was that? Who did you go and work for then? So I went to work with Saicho, uh, which is a brand of sparkling tea. And they started in the UK uh, three years ago now, I believe. Uh, incredibly successful in Southeast Asia. And then they wanted to uh, accelerate their growth in, in the UK. And I joined in as their first uh, full-time employee back in January 2022. I'm losing track of time now. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Time yeah. goes too quickly. That's the problem. Um, and do you still work for them now? No, I did not because I uh, decided that I wanted to build my own consulting business. 
So I, I, I did spend a year working with Sideshow, uh, which, was, which was a fantastic experience um, in many respects. And then at the start of 2023, I, I started uh, Matthias Consulting, uh, which is a, a consultancy business. Um, I call I call my my business the sober agency, and I'm trying to. So I, I'm I'm so I'm trying. Yeah, I'm I'm helping uh, startup brands in the online space to launch in the UK market. So using all my uh, my knowledge, expertise, and and skills to uh, um, to help um, brands, mostly brands that want to to grow organically, uh, to uh, to get started in the UK. Brilliant. So yeah and, Brilliant. Uh, so you're completely immersed now in the non-alcoholic space yeah absolutely and you know i've kind of uh, but it's a funny one launching such a business because at the moment i'm still working on my own um and i've got i've got a vision to to set up a, a network of brand ambassadors for the non alcoholic space uh, to help the new brands going into market because there's, there's a lot of demands for uh for ad hoc uh, help with sampling campaigns and delivering trainings and you know i believe that education is key for the for the category to grow the the the, the, the trends is there but you know to keep the category healthy and growing education is going to be uh, is going to be key a lot you know arguably a lot of consumers that are either um interested or already kind of uh, connected to the space um, a lot of them don't understand most of the products that are on offer, and it's really important to uh, um, to educate our consumers. Yeah. So, um, so, so, yeah. So there's, uh, um, and I forgot the initial question. Now, I feel like I <laughs> went on a tangent. No, 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 that's absolutely fine. No, it's all really interesting. So you also obviously do work with Healthy Hospo and you've set up a chess club there. Tell us a bit more about what Healthy Hospo does and how yeah. you're involved. So Healthy Hospo is a non-profit organization that was set up by uh, Tim back in 2016, 2017 as a a way to bounce back from uh, his uh, suicide attempt. So he was gonna. He went deep into darkness. Uh, he was. He was operating as a global brand ambassador for a brand of of bourbon, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Attempted suicide in his hotel room while on a business trip, and uh, and then managed to to build something incredible on the back of that. So he wanted to share his story and help hospitality professional um, with, um, with kind of, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it, but in, es in essence, Healthy Hospital is there to, to prevent, to do prevention uh, and promotion for mental health and well-being in the hospitality industry. So, for example, we've got a number of uh, um, online learning courses available on our platform um, that covers uh, a lot of different subjects. So our special subjects are sleep, eat, um, exercise, so physical health, uh, connection. Um, and we kind of try and give uh, our peers some tips on uh, how to improve their mental well-being. Um, to make sure that they, they keep kind of uh, they keep their mental health in check, so it's uh, it's mostly preventive work that yeah. has been done. So we've got a series of online courses available on our platform, and we also deliver in-person training. So for example, tomorrow uh, I've been invited to deliver a session in uh, in Chester as part of the Bar World of Tomorrow program. Uh, run by Pernoica UK, so they've added this element of um, of yeah prevention to their new program, which is fantastic. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, how you can do um, little improvements to your daily routine, um, and we'll be covering um, sleep, nutrition, and we'll be covering a connection, that is connection to yourself, 
to others and to nature. Uh, and we'll be covering um, sleep, eat, exercise, physical health, how, can, how can you can improve, make those little changes that will improve, have a, a direct impact on, on, your, uh, on your mental health altogether. Yeah. So I've always been um, a, a big fan of what Tim has set up with Healthy Ospo because when he did that, I was going through my own struggle. Um, I was not ready to acknowledge it. I was not ready to become a voice in the industry. Um, but I was kind of, it started to really resonate with me. And, and I'd like to think that it had an impact on me kind of, uh, making the lifestyle changes that I've made for myself. Um, and now, yeah, I became an ambassador and through different conversation um, that happened during dry January this year, I saw a massive gap in the, in the industry um, and, and how the, the, the industry professionals were connecting with each other. Um, so I, I, I identified a gap, a gap in mentoring. A lot of, of youngsters go, come into this hospitality, not necessarily by choice. You know, very much like me, they need a job, they, they learn a job or, or they're studying or what have you. Uh, and there's no kind of clear career path um, available to, to them or they, they, they don't know about them. And generally, you know, if I look back on, on my time in hospitality, I had access to to more experienced professionals around me. I had access to mentoring if I had any question to ask. And, and it feels like this doesn't exist anymore. The pandemic had a, a, a deep impact and, and I damaged a lot of our industry. And that's a little part that we might not be aware of, but I believe that it really damaged connections in, in, in the industry. Um, and with that in mind, I wanted to create a, a community platform uh, that I would offer the opportunity for professionals to connect, socialize uh, through an activity that doesn't involve drinking alcohol. Um, so, you know, the OSPO Chess Club obviously will promote no and law, yeah. uh, but we're not here to preach uh, sobriety. We're here to offer a platform uh, for hospitality professional to to socialize, connect, and then also give them an opportunity to learn or develop a new skill, because uh, the game of chess is is a passion of mine, and it's fantastic to it's a fantastic way to improve your your brain fit, fitness. You know, I do a little bit of chess studying every day as part of my brain fitness routine. You know, so even if it's five minutes, looking at at a few chess puzzles. Uh, you know, it, <clears throat> well, it's like doing Sudoku on your commute, you know, it's like it gets your brain going. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I've just put everything together and uh, set up uh, the Ch um, Healthy Ospo Chess Club uh, that meets every uh, every Monday afternoon between one and three, one and four, sorry. Uh, so looking forward to uh, uh, to uh, to opening up the, the, the club session this afternoon. And uh, yeah, at the moment it's, it's a social club, it's open to everyone, players of all levels. Uh, you know, uh, they are players strong enough to teach the game, um, and uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and also you know the opportunity to exchange and kind of improve your 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 chess as yeah. as you meet in a in a safe environment. Let's put it this. Yeah. And so is that online? No, that's in person. That's in person. Okay. We did set up a group online on chess.com, which is one of the main chess platform. Uh, but the, the 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 main idea with the chess club is to foster uh, in-person connection. Yeah. Um, so where do you meet, Stan? So every Monday at 1 p.m. until 4 p.m. And for the winter, we relocated to a fantastic venue at the heart of Milebourne in London. It's the uh, Zeta townhouse or the Zeta in Milebourne. We've got a lovely, lovely, uh, very cozy space uh, where we, we meet every Monday. 
Excellent. And I'm assuming they do use some lovely low and no drinks and uh, there's lots of alcohol-free beverages available. Oh, yeah. And, and that is thanks to, uh, to our many supporters and sponsors. Uh, so we've had a donation of beautiful products um, that you may have heard of. You probably have tried most of them uh, in the past, but um, uh, Colette uh, Safel from Myth Drinks, she's, she's uh, given us some stock of, of Myth. So we've made some beautiful piña coladas, non-alcoholic piña coladas over the summer. Uh, we've uh, we've we've got the support of uh, Everleaf and Real Sparkling Tea, uh, yeah. so we make some beautiful drinks with those as well. Um, and we welcome <clears throat> anyone to uh, to donate stock. Uh, again, we we are a charity. Uh, you know, everything that we do is on a volunteering basis. So I volunteer my time uh, to run the the chess club, and uh, we always very grateful for. Uh, for no and low brands to to help us out um, in in our efforts. Yeah, uh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. So, um, obviously, you're not drinking now, and it sounds like you don't think that you're ever going to drink alcohol again. Ever, <laughs> no. I, don't, I don't see that having a part in my life. Ever no. Again. So, do you, have you found the low and no alcohol? um options helpful or do you tend have you just tended to just not drink too many of them how have you found that either helped or or not in Incre your over time well incredibly helpful uh in in a sense that i enjoy going out and you know if i look back uh, let's say ten years ago, when I start, when I when I signed up for my first marathon, and I decided to to take a break from alcohol while I was training, I remember sometimes uh, having to to go to events in some of the top cocktail bars in London, and the only options available to me were sparkling water or pineapple juice. It gets boring very quickly. It doesn't kind of make you want to go out anymore, and which is a shame. Um, and at home, I, I never really had any problem. Uh, you know, I could I could spend a month drinking sparkling water. I was quite happy with that. But I have to say that the, uh, I'm very grateful for the for the no and low category and the, the way it's going because now we've got so many incredible products available to us that I have never I never experienced the fear of missing out because I know that. I, wherever i go now almost wherever i go there will be some options of very good quality non-alcoholic uh, cocktails or not necessarily cocktails but options uh, yeah. or grown-up options um you know yeah. i don't like to, to consider soft drinks as an option for for sober uh people like me <clears throat> So what's what's your favorite drink? What do you really enjoy drinking? And then um give us the brand that you think is the one to watch. The one to oh I mean there's a one to watch every every other week. Uh, <laughs> it, it it depends it depends on on what you you uh, you like, what sort of drink. So I'm I'm a big fan of uh always be a, a big beer drinker. So I quite I quite enjoy my my normal beers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've uh, um, I've always been a big fan of Lucky Saint, and I think that has probably more of I've got an emotional attachment to them because they were there when I started my journey into into sobriety, uh, and you know somehow I discovered them as a guest, be on tap in one of my favorite restaurants in Shoreditch, at a time where I was trying to moderate so i was not sober yet and i found this option of tap on tap loved it i'm like okay maybe this is you know possible um but you know there are fantastic uh non-alcoholic beers out there uh, to name a few i've been impressed with the range at brulo uh i've i've loved all functions been doing so that's a functional beer um i recently discovered clean clean break from uh, from richard uh, uh based in leeds a lovely crisp parallel 
perfect for your after run uh, kind of uh, a little beer. Um, in terms of uh, wine, because you know I'm French after all, uh, yeah. and I think wine has been the most challenging um, kind of area of the non arc space because uh, you know really difficult to produce quality non arc wine. Uh, we we work very closely with Moderato, um, which is a French brand, and they're about to launch. Uh, a natural cuvee, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of of uh, of uh, brand, and you know, I don't want to single out any, but I've I found myself reaching out to Zeno lately. Uh, both the white and red, very good. Uh, Naughty makes a beautiful red. I uh, love the Naughty sparkling. I love the. Uh, uh, the real, com the, the real sparkling tea. Uh, that, was, that was my latest purchase. Um, as I was hosting yeah. my sister and brother-in-law at home, we had a bottle of uh, peony blush with uh, with our branch. It was lovely. Um, Saicho Jicha is a, is a beautiful uh, product to, to to if you like fruit pairings. Uh, in terms of of spirits, you know, Everleaf Three Spirits always been. Um, Kind of close to me, uh, Myth Coconut. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't possibly not mention Myth Coconut. Um, if you like pina coladas, uh, there's, there's kind of uh, uh, no other ways. Uh, what else? Um, and I'm, I'm really kind of uh, into vermouth like products aperitif like products uh, right. I, I was a big fan a big fan of negronis so i like to to explore new um new new products with kind of a little uh, um bitter uh sweet kind of flavor profile if you like uh, one one to watch i don't I, hopefully it's going to come to the uk soon but i've discovered a brand called conviv which is uh, an italian brand 100% made from uh, Italian products. And I, I think those two products, they've got two, two SKUs, are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. I, I have tried most of the products you mentioned. I'm not a big beer drinker, so I don't know so much on the beer, but um, we stocked Lucky Saint here at the hotel. Um, it's definitely, I think, the best known non alk beer yeah. brand, definitely. It's in the UK. done an amazing job in the, in the space, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Excellent. So what we'll do is we'll pop um, links in the show notes of how to get in touch with you. Um, but thank you so much for joining us on Stories Thanks. from My Drinking Days. It's been fantastic to speak to you and lovely to get to know your story a bit more. Uh, and I really look forward to, to getting to know you better through, through our networking group. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again for having me, Harry. It's been uh, lovely talking to you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, uh, to connecting again soon. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you've been listening to Stories from My Drinking Days. My name's Harry Fell um, from No Low Cocktails and Bars. Thank you.